Hey, how are you, President Frank? How's everything? The, everything is fine. Thank you very much, Dr. Komatar. Well, listen, I'm sorry about all those uh, technical difficulties, but anyway, I'm glad we uh, got you on. It was, uh, it was pretty complicated, but I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. Is that all right? That is fine. All right, perfect. Well, we are uh, lucky to speak with uh, President Julio Frank today. Uh, he is the sixth president of the University of Miami. Uh, he's also a professor of public health, the healthcare sector management and sociology. Uh, prior to joining UM, uh, Dr. Frank served for 17 years as Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and Professor of Public Health at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he was also Minister of Health of Mexico from 2000 to 2006 and Founding Director General of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, uh, the Executive Director of the World Health Director. Organization and Senior Fellow in the Global Health Program of the Gates Foundation. Uh, he holds a medical degree from the National University of Mexico, as well as an MPH and PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, his scholarly production, which includes over 180 articles, has been cited more than 23,000 times. Uh, he's also written three best-selling novels uh, of note. He serves on the board of the United Nations Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and has chaired the board of the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. Uh, he's pretty much a member of every single medical uh, committee there is, and he's received several awards and honorary degrees from universities in the United States, Canada, Switzerland, and Mexico. Uh, so in short, Dr. Frank, President Frank, has uh, been in leadership positions in all relevant aspects of public health, uh, and he has been leading the University of Miami over the last couple of years, and we're obviously privileged to have him here today talking about future direction. So again, thank you, Dr. Frank, and, and a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, I was only seven years dean at Harvard, not 17. <laughs> so, oh, okay. All right. A, All right. I don't short. want to add years unnecessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. Uh, exactly. Well, we'll just start with the obvious, talking about the future and obviously where, where UM is going. Let's just start with how do you feel that you have dealt with COVID in the last year and a half? And what are the future directions for how the university is going to be dealing with it? So, you know, the, the I'm very proud of the way the university dealt with COVID last year. Uh, we were opened throughout the entire academic year that started in August of 2020. Uh, I mean, obviously, in the spring, when OHO declared the pandemic, we migrated to a, to a remote format for the, for the second half of the spring semester of 2020. But then during the summer of 2020, we prepared the campus. We made major investments to make the campus safe. And we were able to open in August of 2020, and we've been open ever since. We, we did an entire academic year, fall of 2020, spring of 2021, and we're now halfway through the fall of 2021. And so far, we have had zero, zero documented cases of each transmission of the virus. We've had cases, but because we instituted a very robust testing and contact tracing regime, we immediately detect cases, we, we can trace the context, and then we can quarantine right as appropriate. Uh, that's been the key with coverage mandatory. Now with vaccines, we've made it mandatory for employees. We cannot make them mandatory for students because of uh, Florida. But still, I mean, uh, about 95% of, of employees, faculty, are vaccinated. And with students, even though it, it's voluntary, it is above 85% of our students. Some groups like medical students, it's close to 100%. So not like 3%. But our, co complete, our, our total average for students, is, it, it's, uh, it's about 85%, which is, which is very good considering it's not mandatory. So we are, we've now routinized the management of, of this. We keep testing. The university invested millions of dollars to develop testing, contract tracing platforms, and remodeling classrooms, changing ventilation. And then we have an academic health system. You are a major part of that. And our academic health system has also been open throughout the pandemic. Uh, for most June of last year, we have basically been running two hospitals, the COVID hospital, with one of the lowest mortality rates, the lowest mortality rates for COVID in the state, and the lowest in the states. And then the regular uh, think of other things. That's also quite the two, the two hospitals in the same building, 
but in a way where we segregate the, uh, the, the two populations to minimize uh, any risk for our non-COVID patients. So I, I would say it's been a very successful operation and I'm very proud of it. No, it sounds like it. So, um, so, so before we do the next question, just your voice is cutting out. So it's going in and out. I don't know if, if there's an issue with your Wi-Fi or the audio, but it was kind of cutting in and out. Okay, I hope it, is, is this better? That's much better, much okay. better. All okay. right. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about all the all the technical issues here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I have you guys had much pushback in terms of students getting vaccines. I know that that's been a very controversial subject throughout the country, but um, you guys do not mandate it. And you said, what is the percentage again of the students that have that have been vaccinated? The average is eighty five percent. That's wonderful. It's higher for medical students, for student athletes. But but that's for the entire student body of uh, approximately uh, seventeen thousand students. It's eighty five percent, which is very good. Yeah, that's we fantastic. have gotten very little pushback. I guess if you choose to enroll in a comprehensive research university like the University of Miami, you tend to believe in science, and so you know you will accept vaccines. We haven't had that much pushback. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. And all the comments you said about the hospital are exactly right. Just having worked at the U Health Tower, uh, the way that they've dealt with COVID, keeping those two hospitals separate uh, is really a testimony to the leadership that's been there. And obviously, you're responsible uh, for a lot of that. Um, moving on to the next question, it, you know, as an elite academic institution, uh, a big responsibility is to tackle world issues, international issues that are going on um, close to us and also far away. How is UM contributing to such world dilemmas like healthcare disparities, global warming, and systemic racism? Well, you know, I, um, I am persuaded that you can be excellent and also relevant. And in fact, that it is our mission to do the research and then to translate the research in search of solutions. And, and that's what we do. For the three specific um, to topics, which I agree are some of the most important topics of our time, healthcare disparities. We have an entire initiative on health equity uh, led by Dr. Erin Kovetz from the Miller School of Medicine, your colleague, in partnership with Jackson Memorial Health System. As you know very well, Jackson is the largest uh, county level public uh, system for providing a safety net of healthcare to the poorest people. And partnering with them, um, the, uh, we, we have a number of initiatives to promote equity where we measure the differentials, we measure the disparities, and we intervene to reduce them. We uh, institute measures uh, uh, that are preventive and proactive to anticipate problems, and we work with the community. We have uh, outreach uh, initiatives like mobile services, that reach out to underprivileged communities. And so that is a very strong focus of our entire U Health uh, Miller School of Medicine enterprise in with a very close partnership with, with Jackson. On global warming, the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, which is a key part of the university, has one of the leading climate research groups in the world. And we provide a lot of, uh, of the scientific knowledge we also have other schools that participate very actively. Our School of Architecture has made major contributions to urban resiliency, particularly not just to global warming, but to rising sea levels, which is another big effect of, uh, of climate change. And then lastly, with respect to systemic racism, uh, I have launched a 15-point agenda for the university to promote racial justice. And one piece of that is the launch of a new Center for Global Back Studies which is now have be, has been formed. It will, we, we, we've created new facilities for them, which will be opening later this year. And that is a main area for research on systemic racism. It's not our only effort, but it is a major investment on the part of the university to understand the root causes and then to correct those causes that belong to us. Part of that is, for example, improving the recruitment of students and faculty our historic average, which was two to three black faculty members recruited every year, 
for this current academic year, we have recruited 14, 14 wow. new faculty, black faculty members. And those are excellent faculty members through our very rigorous um, search processes, but it, it required intentionality, reaching out for those very talented uh, faculty members to apply to jobs, and then they, they were very successful in getting selected. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit later about how you recruit, because that's so important for the university to bring in the best and the brightest people. But, you know, so, so you guys are making an impact globally, which is tremendous. What about how does the university give back to its local community, Miami, greater area? Well, what are you guys doing to kind of give back locally? Well, I, I always say that we are not a university in Miami, but the university of Miami. We're not just in the city, we're of the city. And the university was founded in 1925 with that spirit. It was always a, you know, it's a key institution. We have the only academic health system in South Florida. That's a big way in which we give back. We provide the most advanced uh, uh, tertiary and quaternary care for our region. Um, you know, if you look at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, we're the only NCI National Cancer Institute designated um, a, a cancer center in South Florida and only one of two in the entire state of Florida and only one of 72 or 73 in the entire country. So we provide that level of excellence and access to service. That's a, a very specific way of serving our community. In addition, our medical students are very active. There's a, 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 a department of community health that's run by medical students for outreach. But beyond that, The rest of the university is very oriented to, uh, to, in, to community engagement. We have a whole area of the university that deals with community engagement. And part of our initiative for racial justice is to fund projects that are carried out together by faculty, staff, and students to benefit, directly benefit our community. So we feel we're really embedded and have a strong commitment to, to what happens in South Florida. Well, I mean, that, that's great to see because obviously as, as, as Miami grows and as South Florida grows, so does the university. So obviously it's a very synergistic relationship. Okay. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of universities and corporations had very difficult financial times during COVID. Um, during this pandemic, which is still ongoing, uh, how is the university looking fiscally? So at the very beginning, you know, when the first cases started being diagnosed, well, when the alarm was sound from China last day of, of 2019, December 31st, that's why it's called COVID-19, incidentally. If it had been notified one day later, it would be called COVID-20. But it was notified on the last day of 2019. So we, here we are, it's COVID-19. Since then, because of my training in global public health, I knew there was a high risk that that would become a pandemic. And we started preparing then. The main attribute of with a new virus, the defining factor is uncertainty. So as the first cases were diagnosed in the United States towards February of last year, and then after March 11, when the World Health Organization declared the pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty. We really didn't know how the point the governor of this an executive order can you hear me uh, yep yep now i can hear you yeah so you know we had to by executive order of the governor at the beginning of the pandemic and this was the right decision there was a moratorium on on non-covid non-urgent care um and so from there until until may 31st The university was losing about a million dollars every day because we couldn't see other patients. Uh, we, as students who were on spring break back in 2020, not to come back. So we were sustaining serious financial losses. So we started some mitigation measures. Obviously, a lot of uh, austerity measures. There was no travel. That was an, an easy save because we couldn't travel anyway. But, uh, but we did have to furlough a few of, of, of our staff. Fortunately, everyone who was furloughed has been called back. There were very few layoffs, and those were only in areas where we could uh, realize some uh, efficiency gains. But it was the fact that we decided to reopen both the hospital after that moratorium expired on June 1st. We were probably the first 
the first um, hospital system to reopen, and also that we were able to reopen campus, that the financial losses have, were mitigated fully. And right now, I can tell you the university is in a very strong financial position. Uh, this is not the reason why we kept open. We kept open exactly to provide the service that our community expects for us. But one very healthy side effect is that we were able to mitigate all, all our, um, our initial losses. We also received some support uh, from the federal government, from the different support for hospitals and for higher education institutions. And, uh, and then the staff made of sacrifices. We suspended the contributions to the pension plan. We were able to restart that a quarter earlier, but that again generated savings. And between the savings we did, the efficiency gains, the support from the, the CARES Act, and our own decision to reopen, especially our own decision to reopen for, edu for instruction on campus and for full service at U Health, all of that has placed the university in a very strong financial position. I mean, that's just amazing to hear that you guys got through the pandemic and, and really just cut short all of your financial losses and that moving forward, it looks like you guys are in a really strong position. Do you guys have a dedicated uh, financial committee? I'm assuming you guys had a large committee that was looking at all of this and vetting all of the decisions that were made. Yes, in the, uh, the outset of the pandemic, you know, we have a, the, the Board of Trustees has a finance committee with very talented experts in, in finances. But we formed what we call a joint task force on finances. And that was a, a, a group, a task force with trustees, mostly from the finance committee, and with our chief financial officers, the one for the university at large and the one for you health, our, our, our chief operating officer and executive vice president for business and finance, Jackie Travisano, myself, uh, the, the chair of the board, the, the provost. And we would meet on a weekly basis, this task force between administration and trustees to really steer the university through the very difficult initial decisions we had to make. Mm -hmm. And we That's were amazing. very positive with the faculty senate who was very supportive of some of our measures, uh, understanding how serious the situation could have become. And many universities are in deep trouble right now, but not us. We are in, in very sound ground. That's, that's a real accomplishment, a real feather in your cap, obviously, as president leading that. Um, you know, staying on the financial topic, obviously endowments are very important to any university. Do you guys have any um, exciting prospects in terms of endowments and fundraising initiatives? Absolutely. We, you know, we are in, 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 in a campaign, a capital campaign for our centennial. And the centennial is in 2025, so we have four more years. But the campaign, the capital campaign, the fundraising campaign actually started when I arrived in 2015. It's a 10-year effort. And, and we have raised significant amount of money. But to your point of, on endowments, a priority has been to grow our endowment. And the endowment, which was about $800 million when I arrived in 2015, is now up, upwards of one, one and a half billion dollars. Wow. Uh, and uh, we have raised, and uh, most of what we have raised, not just, you know, our gains in investing the endowment, but the additions to the principle, to the corpus of the endowment, has been focused on two priorities, endowed shares and endowed scholarships. In endowed chairs, we have a very exciting initiative. It's called 100 Talents. And the idea is to raise 100 endowed positions for our 100th anniversary. And I'm glad to, to tell you that we have raised already 70 of those 100. Wow. So we're e even a little bit ahead of schedule to meet our goal of 100 by the 100th anniversary, which will be in four years. Similarly, we, we are well on our way to greatly improve the number of endowed scholarships. So, so those are very exciting initiatives. Wow, that is absolutely stunning that you guys have gone over the billion mark easily over, you know, in the time that you've been there. Um, you know, again, staying on the financial questions, uh, a, a big issue that, that, that many colleges, I would say most colleges are dealing with, are just rising tuitions. Uh, these tuitions at all universities continue to go up. Uh, and that can be prohibitive a lot of times to many excellent students if they don't get the appropriate financial aid. What is the University of Miami doing to address that issue? Yes, you know, at my inaugural speech in January of 2016, I made a commitment that by the centennial, the university would, meet, would be meeting, fully meeting financial need, demonstrated financial need. Now, I want to be very clear, that is not the same thing as free college. 
In fact, I think free college is not a good idea because it subsidizes people who really don't need it. You need to focus on the concept of financial need. And what that means is we have a full cost of attendance and the concept of, full fi of, of financial need is the gap between your ability to cover the full cost of attendance and that cost. For some families, the gap is zero. They're wealthy families. They can fully afford the college education. There's no, no point in allocating our scarce dollars to, to that when, when that is, there's no need in reality. And we only do it when we want to recruit you know, truly exceptional people, but, but, but there's no need there. At the other end of the spectrum, we have families where, where the need is 100% and they really cannot come unless there's a full ride. And we will provide that. The good news is that we met that, that commitment uh, of needing full demonstrated. I mean, there's a very rigorous methodology to measure financial need. But we have met that since last year. So ahead of schedule, we've been able to meet that. Now, we want to go beyond financial need. We want to be able to meet other en enhancement opportunities like study abroad <clears throat> and others. That's our next frontier. But at this point, we, we are now uh, being able to ascertain your financial need and irrespective of your socioeconomic status, provide that, that aid. My philosophy is that lack of money should not be a barrier for people, for students who have the capacity to benefit we are a selective university. We are very selective. In fact, because our applications are going up, we, and we're not growing the number of undergraduate students, our admission rate has, has been uh, lower and lower because we, 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 we fortunately have a growing number of people who wanna study here. So we're very selective. But once you demonstrate that you have that capacity, uh, lack of money should not be the barrier uh, standing between you and the opportunity offered by an, uh, a world-class education at the University of Miami. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that is so well said. I, I very much agree with what you said, that college uh, should not be free for everyone because then you're basically incentivizing people who honestly would not benefit from college. And, and, and the need-based financial aid, I think, is, is so critical. And that the, you know, the fact that you guys are meeting 100% of the financial need <clears throat> goes a long way. And I, I don't think many universities are doing what you guys are doing in terms of giving that type of financial aid. Um, are you guys expanding in any way, shape or form, meaning uh, undergraduate campus, medical campus, hospital systems? Is that in the future? So we have a very vigorous um, set of projects. Uh, so on, on the Coral Gables campus, our big, big project now is a total renovation, to, total substitution actually, of every one of our, of our uh, residential facilities. That's a 10 year plan that had been, the, people were working on it even before I arrived, but one of my first actions was to approve it. And it's been led by Dr. Patricia Whiteley, our superb uh, senior vice president for student affairs. Fi phase one was the completion of um, Lakeside Village. Really, I think the best residential facilities in the country, just a beautiful facility. We were able to open that in May of 2020, just as the pandemic was hitting. And that was a big part of why we were able to also be open because we had a, an additional 1,100 beds, uh, beds, uh, beds uh, on campus at that point. Uh, we also have other big investment opportunities here. We're finishing the five uh, institutes in STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This is the Frost after Dr. Philip Frost and his wife, Patricia, gave $100 million for the Frost Institute for Chemistry and Molecular Science. This is the first one. It's a beautiful building. It's coming up. We are starting the night recital hall, a beautiful addition to our Frost School of Music. Uh, uh, and, and there are other projects that, uh, that are going on on the Coral Gables. And then at U-Health, we have a very vigorous um, uh, development and expansion, particularly following the very successful model of the Lennar uh, which in high specialty uh, tertiary specialty uh, care. And, and we're doing that on a regional basis with major expansion plus many, many renovations at U Health Tower, including brand new uh, uh, operating theaters and other such renovations. So That's, a lot, yeah, a lot I, of growth, 
a lot of growth across the university, yes. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen it up at the hospital, you know, just in terms of, like you said, expansion of the ORs, expansion uh, into different uh, satellite facilities. That obviously helps increase the footprint uh, of the university. What about the Caribbean? Are you guys having any active collaborations or growth into the Caribbean, particularly, you know, let's say Bahamas? We'll tell you, we have a very, very engagement with it. The Caribbean, uh, clearly with the Bahamas, when they were hit by the hurricane uh, in 2019, we were very active there. Um, Dean Henri Ford uh, led the, the work along with the work that, that uh, Dr. Barth Green has, you know, for many, many years carried out, not just with the Bahamas, not with this late, latest um, uh, hurricane, but, but with Haiti, with both the earthquake, the, the earthquake 10 years ago and the more recent earthquake. So we have a very strong engagement with the uh, Caribbean in cases of emergency. But academically, we have a, a very strong partnership with the University of the West Indies, which is the premier university in the, with campuses across uh, uh, the, the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, we are planning and hoping to do that early next year to open actually a, an office of the University of Miami at the main campus of the University of the West Indies in, in Mona, Jamaica, near Kingston. Wow. Uh, so our engagement with the Caribbean is, it runs very deep and obviously uh, it's, it's a very close relationship and uh, part of the advantages. There are, there are parts in the Caribbean that consider the University of Miami as their university. It's, it's the university that most families want to send their kids to. Wow, that's great to hear about the West Indies. That, that, that's the first I've heard and that, is, that sounds very exciting. Um, you know, we're currently in the midst of a technology boom. Um, as a university um, that has higher learning, how are you encouraging entrepreneurship and your students and your faculty in this tech era? It's a very high priority for us. And, you know, one of the side effects of the pandemic, major migration of tech investors, tech entrepreneurs, mostly from Silicon Valley and New York into Miami. Uh, 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 Major Francis Suarez, Major Levine Cava, uh, Major Lagos here in Coral Gables, they've been very active in, 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 in promoting um, the, the county and our cities, cities where we're located, um, as a major hub for innovation. And we're very grateful for their leadership there. For the university, this is a huge opportunity. And, I, you know, we're, we're both promoting... I call this going inside out, the great research that's done at the university, at the Miller School of Medicine, at the rest of the university, at the Rosenstiel School. We are pushing out and helping our researchers to develop uh, uh, startups and raise venture funds uh, and, and create intellectual property so that their discoveries can, can, can be translated into solutions. And then we're doing the outsiding we're we're talking to those tech entrepreneurs and understanding their needs and trying to respond by increasing our pipeline of talent and then something that's very exciting that i announced at the state of the u uh, address that i gave just a, a, a week and a half ago uh, we're launching something called the new century college this is an area to experiment with with educational innovation the first uh, program we're having is we're partnering with one of the most innovative startups in education innovation um, called Minerva to launch a, a, an undergraduate degree in innovation. And that will complement efforts going on at the business school. There's a whole entrepreneurship and innovation program there. At the School of Engineer with our new dean, Pratim Biswas, <clears throat> at, the, at the music school where there's a strong thrust as our school of communication, innovation, and obviously at the Miller School, is an, is an cross-cutting priority for all of our schools. We're being very intentional, and in the face of this Miami moment, where we have all, a Miami movement, people moving to Miami, we feel this is a huge opportunity for the university and a way in which we can increase our service to the community. Yeah, and I would say that, that, that especially in the medical uh, field, obviously innovation is so important. And I know that there's many doctors collaborating from the, from the medical campus with the undergraduate. And that is so exciting when you can combine 
for example, neurosurgery and like biomedical engineering to come up with new, to come up with new technology. So obviously a great, a great forum for that. Uh, you had mentioned earlier uh, how you brought in such superstars into the university. H how do you guys identify and then recruit fields? Um, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah. How do we identify and recruit talent? I, you know, this is, this is, I would say, my main job. <laughs> We, you know, the university is not its buildings or its equipment, it's its people. We are a people business. The university is a magical space where very talented and committed people, we call them faculty, uh, meet and mentor and work with incredibly promising young people, we call them students, all the time supported by very loyal, devoted people. We call them staff members. But it's all about the people, whether it's faculty, staff, students. And for us, if we are in the people business, talent is our currency, and that is our top priority. And so when it comes to faculty, we have very elaborate plans in each of our 11 schools and colleges to recruit uh, the top talent to do so with an eye at diversity, because diversity enhances it. It provides diversity, not just ethnic and racial diversity. I just mentioned we have now 14 new black faculty members, but also diversity of thought. We believe in having diverse perspectives, but diverse political positions. We believe in, in, in diversity at, along every dimension of diversity. And, um, and that is our, our main, my, my main job is along with the provost to make sure we attract that, that uh, top talent to the university. Yeah, I mean, so you said it best. I think having diversity, acceptance, inclusion is critical for any major corporation, institution. Um, looking ahead as president of UM, what would you say is your one year, your three year, and your five year vision? Well, the, 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 the one year is to quickly reactivate our pathway to, to you know the the execution on our strategic plan we have a strategic plan to the centennial it's called the roadmap to our new century it was approved by the board in early in in actually late in 2007 i i i launched that process with my inaugural speech in january of 2006 and then shortly a couple of years later we refined that we did a lot of town halls consultations and we have a formal strategic plan called the Roadmap to Our New Century. We were well on our way to executing that, but obviously the pandemic required all our attention. And the pandemic did accelerate some parts of that plan, including the adoption of, of educational innovation and, and technologies. But we need to, um, but, but, we, but it also set us back on others. So we're reactivating the execution. We're adjusting the strategy based on, 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 on the new realities brought about by the pandemic. So in this first year, I would say moving forward with educational innovation, which we, uh, the pandemic forced us to do that, accelerate that. We need to accelerate now, uh, now that we're past the acute phase of the pandemic. And um, you health, the pandemic has transformed healthcare in a major way, has disrupted. We're updating our plans and quickly executing, resuming our, our growth plans that I was talking about uh, in a, a moment ago. I think in this first year, that's our, our and, and then the third big area of focus is taking advantage of the opportunities posed by this uh, technology moment for Miami, uh, as, I, as I was saying in response to the previous question. And then the next horizon, I would say it's the next four years because we really have a deadline, which is the centennial. And we have very ambitious goals there. We want to deepen, we want to end up uh, raising the money for the 100 talents, which will help us recruit top talent. We want to increase the amount of endowed scholarships. We provide a lot of financial aid, but, but, but we still need to increase the proportion of that financial aid that's done through endowed scholarships. And we have all the projects that I mentioned to finalize the construction projects. So it's a very, very rich agenda. We need to, by 2025, make sure we have created the conditions for the university to enter its second century in the strongest possible way and as a top leading 
uh, Comprehensive Research University. Listen, President Frank, I know how busy you are. Uh, just a phenomenal interview. You certainly deserve a tremendous amount of, of credit for the fact that this university has gone from being good to great to now being one of the best in the country. Uh, the thought leaders, the growth, the fact that you've made it through this pandemic, uh, you know, fiscally sound and the university is still moving ahead. Uh, obviously, a lot of that is your leadership. Uh, and so thank you for everything you've done. Look forward to the next several years under your leadership and, and seeing what the University of Miami achieves next. So again, have a wonderful Friday. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Cometa, and thank you to all your viewers. Wonderful. Take care. Bye-bye.